I'm here today with Sean Mulvihill, and I'm going to be asking him some questions, and I'd like to start right in. Sean, can you tell me a little bit about your family's history with cavernous angioma? Sure, no problem. Thanks, Connie. I'm very happy to meet with you today. So my history, I didn't know a whole lot about cavernous malformations until about 2007. Now, around 2006, I had a headache for just about a full year, and I had no idea why, and um, pr pretty close around September or so, I passed out, and I wasn't sure exactly what happened. Um, so anyways, went to the hospital, and they you know, said it could just be a fainting episode. So they did some tests, ran some tests, and um, I did do an MRI, which was actually the day before my wedding, so talk about stress, right? <laughs> and the wedding. So we went on our honeymoon and came back a few weeks later. And I went and chatted with the doctor. And he said, well, you have something called, um, he passed me a piece of paper and said, it's called cavernous malformations. And I said, what is that? And what can happen? And so he briefly explained what it is. And he said, well, either nothing can happen or you can die. So unfortunately, that was my first introduction to cavernous malformations. Now, as I know, there's a very wide spectrum, right? A lot of people have cavernous malformations and they're totally fine their whole, <coughs> excuse me, their whole life, or they don't even know that they have them. So um, that, that was my, my first kind of delve into that. Prior to that, in the late 90s, my mom had brain surgery. And we didn't know exactly why. At that time, we thought, you know, it could have been an aneurysm or something. But looking back, it, it would be the cavernous malformation because I have the CCM1, which is the familial version of the gene. And now we have, uh, including myself, there's seven people in my family that have the cavernomas. Wow. Now, I have three major, you know, I, I had three bigger cavernous malformations in the brain and in... 2009, I was having a pretty rough time. You know, I had on and off headaches, and I'd also had you know another another seizure. So I went to the hospital, and they said, you know what, it, it's bleeding. One of yours has to come out. Which, to my surprise, it was one that was in my third ventricle, which is which is quite deep, and it was one that they had said that they would never touch. But they decided, you know what, this blocking the flow of cerebral spinal fluid, so we need to take it out. So April Fools, 2009, I uh, had brain surgery to remove one of my cavernomas. You know what? It was at the Toronto Western Hospital, performed by Dr. Walls, fantastic person. Now I'm doing, I'm doing great. Um, you know, I still have some cavernomas in there, so I still live with that concern daily that perhaps something might happen. But you know what? Something might not happen, right? right. Um, so that's, that's, that was kind of my introduction. And as I said, I have some family members, cousins that have it. And in 2007, we, we had a son. And so we decided to get him tested to see if he did have the gene or not. It turns out that, yes, he was tested positive for the gene. He's had subsequent MRIs. And there's nothing in there that indicates that he has anything that has uh, formed. So, you know, we thank God for that fact that he's still healthy. And, you know, there's nothing there. And so Jackson, your son Jackson, also has a second diagnosis as well. Can, can you tell us what that is and if it has any effect on how you manage his cavernous malformations? Sure, of course. He has something called 22Q gene deletion. They're two totally separate um, uh, genetic disorders. One has nothing to do with the other. The 22Q, essentially, it's a tiny little piece of the chromosome that's, that's missing. And the way it affects him is through his gross motor skills. He didn't walk till he was about two and a half, um, and he still wears supports on his legs to help him walk. Um, and it, it, a lot of people who have the 22Q, it's not very well known either, um, but they also have, you know, it could be diagnosed with autism. Um, a lot of them wear, you know, wear glasses, which he does. Now, the doctors weren't sure if the cover small formation and 22Q were related, and at this point, it doesn't seem as though they doesn't seem as though they are. Now, in saying that, children with 22Q, they could often have seizures, and we don't know why. Okay, and so in the past year or so, my son has, <clears throat> excuse me, has had a few seizures, 
And so, of course, knowing that he has the cavernomas and the 22Q, we just brought him directly to the sick kids hospital to kind of, you know, have a look and, and check him out. So, in, in that sense, knowing that he has the cavernous malformations, I get a little bit more concerned, right? My anxiety may spike up a little bit more. Um, so we just kind of follow them in that respect. But like I said, there's nothing there as far as covers malformation for concern. So it could have been something totally unrelated um, to the CCM1, right? It could have just been perhaps low iron, something like that. So we just keep an eye on them and he still continues to live a happy, positive life. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, you're in Canada. And yep. you are now the president of Angioma Alliance Canada, and I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the organization and what it's doing now, um, what you're looking forward to. Sure. Well, as you know, Connie, we started the Angioma Alliance Canada in 2011 when you, you know, you put the, the word out there asking for other people to step up. And so myself and a few other people who met via the chat line that Angioma Alliance in the U.S. has, um, we decided to work together and, and to form the Canadian Alliance. And as you said, yes, I am now the president, uh, proud president. In the past few months, we've had organizational change, and things are going extremely well for us. We, um, you know, we have a fair, we have a good following. There wasn't any representation in Canada, so people didn't know where to turn. And um, Saturday, June 6th, we're having our fourth annual Canadian conference. We have a, a good amount of people that have registered for that. And we have Dr. Locke McDonald, who works with St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, neurosurgeon there, as well as um, Dr. Brent Derry, who you know as well. He is a senior science uh, researcher at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. He's going to be speaking for us as well, talking a lot about you know the worm models and 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 kind of how how they work to to work toward a cure. Right, and so he's been one of our biggest supporters. He helps us out um, every step of the way. I met with them last week, and he's pretty excited for, for the conference as well. And so, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, beyond June sixth, what is mm -hmm. it that you um, that NGM Alliance Canada has up its sleeve? What are you planning? Well, I know that Dr. Derry wants to get a lot of Canadians together so that he can, you know, sequence the genes and, and do a lot of work to work towards a cure. So one of the big things we'll be doing is to be collecting a lot of people and, and getting their information so that we can work with the Sick Kids Hospital and, and work more towards the cure. Um, so essentially in, in Canada, we're, we're growing the organization. We have representation in, in Ontario and we have some on the West Coast, um, some people in Quebec, and we're also chatting with someone out in the West, or excuse me, in the East, in Halifax, to join our organization as well. And one of the things we've been talking about is potentially having a conference in other parts of Canada. Because as you know, you know, I know when I was first diagnosed, there was no place to turn, right, except for yourself, which was fantastic that you started the organization. Um, and it needs to be done here in Canada as well. So I know Dr. Derry said he's more than willing to travel with me and we can go across Canada and hold conferences in different, um, different provinces. So I know people are, are pretty excited about that in our group, the Angelum Alliance Canada. You know, we're a very tightly knit group now and everyone's everyone's working together for, for a common cure. So um, we're, we're running a little short on time. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that um, you haven't covered already that you want to make sure people know? Sure. sure. I know that when I was first diagnosed, it was something that you know, I was scared. I didn't know anything about it. And especially if you start researching it and Googling it, you kind of see all these, you know, danger warning signs and get a little bit more more concerned. Well, I know that it was like that for me. I was I was pretty concerned and that's all I ever thought about. But you know what, it, it does get easier, right? You get to understand that it's not something that's just gonna, you know, explode one day and, and you're not gonna make it. There's there's you have time. Right, and there's a lot of great medical professionals out there. So, in the beginning, I thought about it a lot, and then I found that the time gets further apart that I did think about it. Right, think about the covers malformations and what could happen, and then you know it gets a lot easier to live with the live with the disease, and then you just don't think about it as much, and there becomes a point where you know you can help other people like like we do. Yeah. So I just want people to know that you can certainly live a happy, healthy life. And, and still have a disease. Thank you. Thank you. 
You're welcome.